Uh, General Kazura, I'd like to go to you first, um, and I think it would be really interesting to hear from you sort of your reflections on sort of where peacekeeping has come from, where it is going, what can we learn from it at the moment, um, to kind of set the scene for our discussion today. So over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, moderator, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think to answer your question, I will start by stating the obvious. We are here to talk about peace keeping missions. And I would say that the three words, the key one is peace. The remaining ones are missions to be conducted to keep that peace. And secondly, I would ask all of us a question, and peace for who? And I believe it is peace for the people, those who don't have peace. So for us to think about the future of peacekeeping missions, we need also to think about you know, their past and their present status so that we can go into the future. So to, to be able to talk about that, I would give a few examples. One of them is here where we are in Rwanda. In 1994, we had a peacekeeping mission here, which was called UNAMIR, United Nations, United Nations Mission in Rwanda. And unfortunately, when things got tough during the genocide against the Tutsi, some, some of them abandoned the people they were supposed to protect. Then the issue was to see if the peace, first of all, were there peace? Secondly, was it kept? They came for keeping peace, which probably was not there. And at the end of the day, they were not there. The second example is where I was as force commander in Mali. Again, we had MINUSMA, which was the, the, the mission uh, for, again, for, in Mali. The question again was, is there any peace to keep? That was from 2013. Ten, day, 10 years down the road, do we still have peace to keep? The third one is just across here in the Republic Democratic of Congo, where has peacekeeping missions from the 1960s. But even today, the question would be, is there peace to be kept? So to think about the future of the peacekeeping missions, we need, we need to go back in times and to see what did we have yesterday, what do we have today, probably to plan for what we would have tomorrow. But whether there was peace or no peace to be kept, we cannot lose hope. We cannot lose hope because we are here to do so. And I believe the future of the peacekeeping missions in, is right in our hands here. We can do better. What we didn't do yesterday can be done today. And also, I can give a few examples to show that something can be done. Recently, in Central African Republic, there we have another peacekeeping mission called MINUSCA. Again, do we still ask the same question if we have peace to keep there? But some time back, uh, at the request of His Excellency President Tuadera, His Excellency Paul Kagame decided to send troops there on bilateral arrangement. There was war, the government was, has been attacked, and 
a battalion of Rwanda Defense Force went there, restored peace, and we have the peacekeeping, which has now peace to keep. There is another example. Again, when His Excellency President Nyusi requested his uh, counterpart, President Pokagame, to help him vis-a-vis -vis the situation which was in Mozambique, he once again sent troops from RDF. They went there. In one month, peace was restored, and now we have peace which can be kept, whether by those who are keeping it today or even another arrangement. So I would say that uh, the peacekeeping mission is, can be done better. The reason why I'm saying so, the future we are talking about is uncertain. We don't know what is happening tomorrow. And it is becoming even more complex. So we need to start thinking about thinking out of the box, looking at where we've done wrong and what we can do better today. We need to see and, and think that probably there is a way of, first of all, thinking about protecting the population. We need to think about having those peacekeeping missions with the purpose of protecting the people. If you allow me, I will give the last example just to underscore what I'm trying to say. I'm happy to be with my brother, General Birame, here. Sometimes we would deploy troops somewhere, maybe who are not fit for the job. I'll give an example. Those time when I was in Mali, I will not mention the country, I'm sorry, but I have a battalion somewhere which had nice tanks, very well painted in white, with the nice cannons, machine guns, everything. And I had also troops, but they were in the north part of the Mali where the real job was, where the rebels and terrorists were. So one day they were attacked. And believe me, it was horrible to see what happened. And yet, troops were there, tanks were there, everything was there. So it is time to think about deploying dedicated soldiers with dedicated equipment and in the right place to do what you have to do. Otherwise, that keeping, peacekeeping mission would lose sense. And all of us here, we need to start understanding that whatever we deploy, wherever we deploy it, is for the people. Because the peace we are talking about is not just the state of, you know, living peacefully. There, no, there, there is a lot of things associated to that. Because once you give them peace, you must give them every other thing to make sure they can live that peace, and they can live longer in that peace. I thank you for very much. Thank you very much. Uh, General Kazura, I wanted to come back to you. Uh, you mentioned at the outset Rwanda's engagement uh, in deploying bilateral forces alongside peacekeeping missions. Uh, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the rationale behind that, uh, given that we are seeing increasingly different types of deployments alongside UN peacekeeping missions that bring different comparative advantages, whether that they can go beyond the mandate of what a UN peacekeeping mission can do, they might be able to deploy more rapidly. Um, so I'd be interested in your insights on sort of the rationale behind that and whether you see that something as part of the future of peacekeeping. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Lisa. And uh, I want to agree with my brothers here on uh, that uh, we all need UN. And it was well said, the UN is not there for the whole solution. It is not perfect, but we need it as, uh, as an institution. And I agree with them. But coming back to what we are discussing today about the future of those operations, 
we need to say that uh, the, the parishions are not there for the sake of being there. They are there for the purpose. And as my brother said very clearly, they, we need trust from the population. But again, trust is not fought for. It is not requested for. Trust is earned according to what you do. So sometimes people are going to have that resentment because they, as he said, they are not getting exactly what they are expecting to get. You may ex explain to them, please, we are coming, don't expect this, and indeed, they will not expect that. So to be trusted is because what you do, not what you have explained. And at the end of the day, whatever we do, we do it for the population. And as long as they are not happy, then definitely there will be that problem. So I totally agree with we need UN. UN is doing what it can, but we can do better. Because as uh, Apuli said, Professor Apuli said that the peacekeeping operations, the, that is semantics, it's, it, it's not, normally it should be peace support operations. But who do you support? Again, there is an ultimate goal you want to achieve. And once you don't achieve that goal, definitely there will be somebody who is not happy. And once he's not happy, he would ask you, why are you not doing what he's supposed to get? And I would also make a, sm a small comment on, uh, on the host country. I do believe from my experience that you deploy, whether it is peace support missions or peace keeping operations, in a country, in a host country, which is already, which is already weak somehow. Because nobody would wish to have those forces deployed in your country if you are self-sufficient. Nobody here would wish to have those uh, those missions in your own country. Sometimes you accept them because you need them. And once you need them, they need to see in you what they expect from you. So I think we do not say that the UN is not, uh, we, we do all agree that we need UN, but once you go to those operations, definitely we need to earn that trust by doing somehow in your own way what they are expecting from you. So coming to your question then, uh, the bilateral arrangement is another solution. As he said, it is a solution which can be combined with other solutions, including the peacekeeping ones. Because you deploy them as quick as you can, your hands are not tied, you can act as quick as you can, depending on the means you have, depending on the threat which is on the ground. So I believe that the bilateral engagement, it's not, it's not the bilateral arrangement and the peacekeeping operations. They are not mutual exclusive. They can work together, as long as what we want to achieve is the same. So we can achieve the bilateral arrangement, can achieve, for instance, what we want to achieve, including peace, and then that peace can be, can be kept because it is already there. I totally want, want to agree with my brothers about the principles of UN missions, including impartiality, including uh, uh, the use of force, non-use of force, and also consent. the consent. But sometimes, the host nation would have the consent and maybe it can accept, I don't know if I can call it consent, but due to the situation it is in, it has accepted to be, to, you know, it is consent. But once you arrive there, the consent is no longer the consent. I think it is the case. Absolutely. <laughs> Secondly, there is the impartiality. Sometimes on the ground it is very, very difficult to be impartial. Again, the principle is there. It is a very good principle, 
But the implementation of that principle is not an easy one. And the last one, I think that I very much share with it with my brothers here, the non-violence. It is fantastic. Don't see these people with uniform and think that they are violent. No, 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 they are non-violent in uniform. But once you are there, you know, there are what we are taught. Once the enemy is coming, you shoot once in the air, and you say, who are you? Then he will continue to come. You shoot again. Please identify yourself. And he continues to come. Then you shoot again. <laughs> and uh, he's very kind. He will continue to come. And, uh, you know. But it, is, it does not happen like that on the ground. See, if you are even so stupid to shoot in the air, you are dead. <laughs> because he knows where you are. But in principle, it is so nice. And I'm trying to be practical and say what the, the real situation on the ground, because so many principle, principles are there. Very nice. Here in Ikigari, in 2018, we signed the protection, the pr protection of civilian principles. 2018. Now it is 2023. We need to evaluate and see how much we are working. So we have so many principles, so many articles. But on, because we are talking about people who are going to die. So you, you are going to earn that trust because you are protecting those people, not because you have principles. So imagine, my brother, General Birame knows you, you, you deploy. I, I really totally agree with you that uh, UN this is what I said at the beginning of my comments. I said the future of whether UN, whether peace support missions or peacekeeping missions, I said it is in our hands. I meant it is all of us. But again, it is all of us, but those who are deploying, those are our own people. So imagine they are deploying somewhere because terrorists and others are not going to write a letter to tell you that I'm coming tomorrow. Be, please get ready. You will never know when they come and how they are and what they want. So it's up to you to be ready. So it is, mine is to tell my brothers all of us who are here and those who are not here to start thinking about when you deploy somebody, deploy him what, what is required for him to survive because he will never protect people when he is not protected. So the idea, as you, you heard about all of us here on this panel, saying that the UN is not perfect, that we don't have everything, that uh, it is the responsibility of you guys who are here, then if it is your responsibility when you are going to deploy, be aware of that. Don't expect too much from UN, as we, we said it here as far as especially the political considerations are concerned. So I believe that what, again, I repeat it, that is my conviction that what we did yesterday probably was fine. But I'm sure it is not what we can do today. And definitely it will not be what we will do tomorrow. So I think we start, we need to think not out of the box, I don't know, as he said, why people would go into the box, then to come, to come out of it to think again. <laughs> so maybe, whether you think out of the box or stay in, it is your business. But let's say time has come to say the peacekeeping, the way we did things in 1990, is not the way we can do it today. And definitely it will not be the way we are, we are going to do it tomorrow. My brother here is now requesting for the state if they have drones, if they have uh, new technologies, equipment to be sent to UN, it is not what we were thinking about yesterday. So by deploying your own troops, please be aware that the UN is not perfect, that we are not perfect, and do it according to how you may make sure that you protect the people where you are going and how 
you're going to make sure that you protect your own people. I will make the last comment saying that, please, I'm sure all of us here, no one would wish to have these troops to be deployed in your country. Because they are, they are going to be deployed in your country because you need them, because you are already weak. So I would even say that why can't, do, why can't we do all we can to make sure, first of all, those forces are not deployed in our own countries. Let it be when you cannot do otherwise. So by the time we leave this place, say, they are not deployed in my country. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Kazura. Um, and I was still going to come to you, General Kazura, in terms of your responses. But maybe to pick up um, on the question about Mali, you were the first force commander of the UN mission that went in there. Um, sort of your reflections from that experience and I guess any of the other points that have been raised. I know there was a point about military education and a few things which might be very um, timely to, to conclude on today as well. Thank you once again. And uh, first of all, before I come to that, I would, I would request, especially the students and uh, others, from the discussion, from here to learn that uh, nobody from anywhere is going to, to give you peace. Because somebody from somewhere will come to help you to keep peace. So please find peace, then let somebody else, if necessary, to help you to keep your own peace. Secondly, in whatever you have said, here and elsewhere, nobody would wish to have other forces deploying in your own country. They can come to work with you, but if you have peace and you, you will be able to develop, you will be able to give to your people what they want. So the ultimate goal is to be peaceful. And please find your own peace first of all. Make your country peaceful. Develop your country. Then work with others to even more, to even make your country very prosper. And once it is no longer necessary, and it is once it is no longer possible, and you need some assistance from elsewhere, Again, as he said, be that host nation which can dictate what you need. Try to be that nation which is, not being, which is not going to be dictated from somebody else to do what they want you to do. And from now, that perspective, if we are going to talk about the future of the peacekeeping operations. I strongly believe that we need UN, we need the peacekeepers, but what we did yesterday, maybe we can change it today for the better of the peacekeepers themselves, of the people, and of the whole organization because we are part of that organization. And definitely for the future, we need to continue, to continue thinking about what we are going to do in future because definitely what we are doing today is going to be different from what we are going to do tomorrow. And from our brothers in Mali, I will just say, keep it up. And let's work together with the UN, with other partners to make sure peace prevails and prosperity comes back. Thank you. Thank you, General Kazura.